Thich Mahabur talks about his sense of frustration sometimes starting with John Mun. He'd ask John Mun a question, and John Mun wouldn't answer it. He'd pull the discussion off to something else. I had the same sense of frustration with the John Fuang. Sometimes I'd ask him a question, and he'd change the topic. And I came to the same conclusion that I found out later that John Mahabhut had come to, which is if the teacher answers all your questions, he's teaching you to be stupid. You have to want to figure things out on your own. That's an important principle, the wanting. As the Buddha said, all things or all phenomena are rooted in desire. That includes not only suffering, which is caused by craving, but also the path. An important part of the path is right effort, and the formula for right effort says that you have to generate desire. You have to want to do this. You have to want to put an end to suffering for it to happen. Which is why a large part of the training is getting you to want that. And it also assumes that you want it, which is why the teachers don't explain everything. I've told you in the past about John Fung's comment when I went back to ordain with him and study with him. He said, you have to learn how to think like a thief. If you're going to steal something from somebody's house, you can't go up to the front door and knock on the door and say, when are you going to be away? Where do you keep your valuables? So I can come in and conveniently take them away. They're going to do everything they can to keep you from knowing. And so you've got to be very observant. You have to case the joint, as we say, and watch. And then you begin to get a sense of when they come, when they go, and which part of the house seems to be the one they're most protective of. And that gives you your clues. When you stay with the teacher, it goes down to even little details about cleaning his hut. For a long time, a John Fung wouldn't let me into his room. I couldn't clean his room. I was in charge of cleaning his porch. It was only after he let me clean his porch and it was finally decided that I knew what I was doing. Even then, he wouldn't let me into the room easily. But occasionally, he'd say, go get this out of my room. He'd give me the key. And after the second or third time, I began to realize this was my chance to see how he organized things in his room. So if the time ever came for me to organize them, I could do it. If I hadn't wanted to do it, I would have just gone in, fetched what he asked for, and gone out, and that was it. And so a large part of the training is that you have to want to practice. And the teacher is there to assume that you want to practice, that sometimes to help motivate you. Make sure that your desire to practice doesn't get get weak or discouraged. But this is something you have to want to do for it to work. After all, if Buddhists could take all living beings to nirvana, if they could save all living beings, we would have been saved a long time ago. The Buddha came to teach the people who wanted to put an end to suffering. It seems like a very reasonable assumption that everybody would want to put it into suffering, but a lot of people don't want to do it themselves. And for those people, the Buddha didn't have that much to, t to teach. His teachings were people who realized that they were suffering, and their suffering was coming from their own actions, and it was something they were going to have to cure within themselves. Because after all, where is suffering? Show me your suffering. I can't see it. You can't see mine. It's something that each of us feels in a very private spot. The cause is also in that private spot, the area where you sense your body, sense your mind from within. That's where you experience craving, that's where you experience suffering, but also that's where you experience the, the factors of the path. So it's all inside. The work has to be done inside. Which is why meditation is not sitting and looking at the trees, looking at the world. It's looking inside to see what's going on, with the desire to straighten it out. And 
and the Buddha's there and the teachers are there to encourage you that there is an end to the suffering. It doesn't have to be that the suffering you feel, the things that weigh you down inside, they're optional. There's something you're doing that's weighing the mind down. And it's in a blind spot, an area where you tend not to look. So you've got to look, 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 and as, as I say in, in Thai, look all around. Draw blue, no, all around. Which is how the practice of concentration is designed to give you this sort of all around perspective. You're seeing not only the breath at the nose, but you're also beginning to learn how to sense the breath in the whole body. Or there's a feeling of pleasure, you really learn how to sense it not only at one or two spots, but let it spread throughout the body. If there are feelings of pain, you try to cut through any lines of connection so that you're not spreading pain through the body, which all too often we unconsciously do. And then you're here to watch. You're not here just to settle down. I mean, when the concentration feels good, it is a nice place to settle down, but you settle down and then there's work to be done. And what you've done is put yourself in a really good position to see all around. Because you begin to realize that events in the mind and events in the body are very closely connected. When you have this all-around vision of the body, you begin to have an all-around vision of the mind. A couple of weeks back I was up in Canada and someone asked me about an experiment. He thought, he said the experiment had proven there was no such thing as free will, that it showed that people would come to decisions or a part of their brain would come to a decision. They could tell from fMRIs. And it would be six seconds later when the person was actually claimed to say, well, this is when I made the decision. I said, that doesn't prove lack of free will at all. What it does show is that a lot of people don't know what's going on in their own minds. And this is one of the purposes of the meditation, is to see what's going on in the mind, to see that blind spot. That's going to go against the grain, and this is why you have to want to do this. There are large parts of your mind that you've been blocking out for various reasons, and there are other parts of the mind that don't want to open them up. But when you can be all around aware of the body, you can become all around aware of the mind in areas that used to be subconscious or buried under many layers of denial are suddenly open. And sometimes it's unpleasant to have them open, but if you have a comfortable spot in the body and a comfortable spot in the mind, it gives you at least a place to stand. And you have conviction in the Buddha's awakening that it is possible to get past these things and you're not quite so overwhelmed. But all of this is inside work. Or as I say, it's an inside job. And you have to overcome some very strong tendencies that want to keep you coming back, coming back, coming back to the old pleasures that you've known in the past, and that you've lost and you want them again. This is why thinking about the Buddhist perspective on that second knowledge of seeing beings in the world dying and being reborn in line with the karma again and again and again, and have it, it's not going anywhere. The universe just keeps going around and around and around, but it doesn't go anyplace. the sense of dismay that he felt. That's what induced him to want finally to get out of it. You can use that conviction to inspire yourself as well. That we're not just here to bliss out. We're here to get a sense of well-being so we can work with that sense of well-being, so we can put us in a position where we can do the work that needs to be done to put an end to this endless cycling around. Because if we don't put an end to it, it's not going to end on its own. There's no guarantee. But you have to want it enough to try to figure out how to do it. And the Buddha himself, that's how he learned, by wanting enough to figure it out. He shows that it's possible and he's given us clues. But there's a lot of the work that we have to do inside because it's dealing with areas of our awareness that are very private, in many cases pre-verbal. 
or whatever verbal aspect there is to the mind's processes, is often buried under many la layers. So you have to want to dig up those layers. So we can do this inside job. So at the very least you can save this one being from suffering. Of course what that means is that you are less of a burden on others. You're not coming back to the feeding chain. You found a happiness that doesn't need to feed. Yes, that's the discovery of stream entry, the first stage of awakening, is that there is this other dimension. And it's very close by. It's not someplace far off, it's very close. But it's in that blind spot. And you have to really want to see it in order to find it. When the Buddha gave Dharma talks and people gained awakening, it wasn't that he tricked them into awakening. He found that they really wanted some place down inside to put an end to suffering. He, he was able to dig up that desire and show that there was something worthy of respect and something to be followed through. But then it was up to them to follow through, given the guidance that he provided. So what you get out of the practice depends on what you put in. And the Buddha and the noble disciples are all there to, to assure you that it's worth putting in all the energy you've got. This is something that's really worth giving your life to. But it's up to you to make that gift.